Excited for this one. Um, I've prepped a lot for this just to kind of give an overview of everything. So we can get started in a couple minutes, but there's going to be a lot here. I'm going to try to get kind of technical with you guys, but what I want to do is kind of go over a high level overview of econ concepts, um, just to give everybody like the technical knowledge that you might need to kind of understand what we're doing with the tokenomics. Uh, because tokenomics is a really funny space right now where um, the design of a lot of tokens don't take a lot of consideration. It's uh, improving and improving, and we'll share some resources that we really like on this topic as well. Uh, for example, I have a favorite economist that also does um, work in the token space. But yeah, no, this is uh, one of our more prepped spaces that we've done, so I'm excited for this one. And yeah, welcome to our space today, Everything Tokenomics. I've been waiting to do this one for a while because I find it so interesting when Luke just goes off on economics. So very excited for this one. The music you just heard was by our sound designer and incredible musician, Jesse. So huge shout out to him. I think we can go ahead and get started. So of course, we will take any questions at the end. You can come up on stage with us, just request to speak, or you can add them to our general chat. Just make sure that you're tagging the community team or myself, pixel underscore Heidi, so that we see all of your questions. And with that, let me give you what Google defines tokenomics as. So tokenomics is a term that captures a token's economics. It describes the factors that impact a token's use and value, including but limited to the tokens, creation and distribution, supply and demand, incentive mechanisms, and token burn schedules. And with that, Luke, take yeah, the floor. So, <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of critiques of the state of tokenomics right now, where um, a lot of the tokenomics that you guys see and are familiar with are really just, uh, I don't want to say Ponzi's, but um, they're thought out in a way just to increase like short-term token value rather than like actually create a long-term and sustainable economy. And yeah, we're seeing a lot of dope ash for that reason. Um, so there is a ton of work that's already done in the field in game development and game design, and obviously also economics that we can pull from. And we are. So what I do in this space first is kind of give um, a dive into econ, and we'll do like a mini crash course in econ 101, just going over a couple of core concepts that lead into tokenomics. Tokenomics are really interesting because really what the tokenomics, what tokenomics are um, is it's this field of economics called international finance. International finance is the study of how currencies are exchanged with one another and how they retain value um, in exchange with one another too. But also tokenomics is kind of built an economy ground up, especially in the game. Um, so we take a couple of strong stances on what tokenomics really are and how we want to design our game, our economy, and all of that. Um, one of the key things is we believe that tokenomics first starts with good game design. So if you don't have a fun game that people are getting value out of, then really the token's doomed from the very beginning. Um, but with that being said, let's just get into it. So I think one of the biggest definitions that we need to start with um, is the definition of money. So what is money? Money is actually pretty clearly defined, but it's also one of those things where if you really think about it, it's kind of this weird concept. So money is typically defined by three metrics. Money is a unit of accounts. It's a store of value and it's exchange of value. Um, so a unit of account means that um, this money is able to um, kind of be quantified. It's able to be understood that like one piece of money equals another piece of money. Um, and it, you need to compare this to something like the old bartering system where um, people actually used to use like different rocks or um, different shells or like interesting things like that cattle as a um, form of money. Um, but that style of a money system is not very good at a unit of account because none of these um, things that were being exchanged and traded were very good at um, being consistent. Um, it needs to be able to store value, um, extremely important. And also, funny enough, one of the uh, areas that a lot of tokenomics really lack, long-term store of value. But um, the blockchain solves this um, in a way where the uh, at least ownership of value is um, very clearly fine in the blockchain and obviously needs to be an exchange of value. So people need to be able to exchange it. Um, and that's why these cryptocurrencies are super interesting because they are, they are money, they are um, all of that. Um, basically, it is an accepted system to trade time, risk, and the prior capital that you might have um, with other people. Um, so then let's kind of go into um, the basics of what an economy is. So an economy is basically all of the aggregate activity that is happening in an ecosystem 
and it's measuring all of that. So an economy is typically measured through this one really basic equation, y equals c plus i plus g plus nx. So output equals assumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. Um, essentially what economists want to do when they are analyzing an economy is measure productivity in an economy. Um, we call it output, but it's really capturing the total amount of you actually being created in an ecosystem. Really important word, the total amount of value being created in an ecosystem. It's not supposed to be speculative. It's not supposed to be measuring all of that. Um, it's a pure measurement on what value is actually being created year by year. Um, and the easiest way to measure that is actually just how money is being spent and how it's being invested, how the government's using it, and how um, it's actually getting exported. Because if you actually think about what that definition is, the uh, total productivity of a nation or of an ecosystem, like, it's a very difficult thing to imagine how to measure that. But the most direct way is just by measuring consumer behavior, essentially. So... That brings us to fiat versus commodity-backed currency. Um, it's funny because the Web3 space, they're really into crypto, but then there's also this like weird branch of libertarian-esque mindsets where um, I think some of the uh, Web3 space really hates things like central banking and they love the gold standard um, for some reason. But um, there's a reason that all the world uses fiat currency in today's day and age um, versus a commodity-backed currency. So if you guys are... Um, a lot of the world used to be on what call, is called the gold standard, where every single U.S. dollar was actually backed by a real piece of gold. Um, and you see this with a lot of these stable coins right now, too. Um, where they'll actually peg currencies dollar to uh, like USDC. That's a bit different. Um, essentially, there was this move to fiat currency um, in the U.S. And there's pros and cons to it. The big pro to moving to a fiat currency is that it gives the ability to have a central bank um, that can let uh, the central bank adjust uh, changing circumstances, adjust the circumstances in the economy is necessary. Um, it essentially allows a government or a central bank entity to predict growth in a better way and control the growth of the nation and the economy better. It gives tools to fight inflation, deflation, stagflation, and it gives tools to kind of grow an economy in an even more efficient um, way. And it also opens up this thing called fractional banking. Um, so fractional banking is, it's quite complicated and we don't really need to go into it, but a key concept that you need to pull from the idea of fiat currency and what it really unlocks is that it unlocks money multipliers. It's kind of, uh, this school of economics called Keynesian economics. So Keynesian economics is this whole school of theory that was developed after the uh, great depression. Um, it was, um, developed by this economy, John Maynard Keynes. Um, and the main idea behind this theory is that um, an economy is really made up of aggregate demand. Um, so just that equation that I told you guys about, um, an economy is measured as a sum of spending by households, by businesses and the government. And it's actually the most driving or the most important driving force in the economy. Um, Keynesian economics, they kind of lean towards justifying government intervention through policies um, in order to like maximize an economy. Um, and then Keynesian economics, what it really relies on is it relies on two different types of mechanics in order to most efficiently um, control the health of the economy. It relies on fiscal policy and it relies on monetary policy. So fiscal policy refers to the use of government spending and tax policies and other things like that to influence the uh, economic conditions. Um, Keynes argues that governments can stabilize cycles, busts, and booms by basically placing money in smart areas. So the, the idea of a money multiplier is that um, if you give money to certain different types of people, or if you put money into certain areas of an economy, um, it's actually much more efficient for the total economy than other areas. So this really goes to a few different um, concepts. So there's this concept of the marginal propensity to consume. There's the concept of the marginal propensity to invest or save. Um, and other multipliers like that as well, too. So the idea is if you give some money, it's actually wildly different based on who you give money to um, actually spend it and use it in an economy. If you give a stimulus check to a billionaire, um, they're going to spend it in a much different way than if you gave a stimulus check to somebody who is um, of lower income. Like um, where that money will get spent will probably get spent in ways that actually benefit the economy in very, very different ways um, per the dollar amount. Uh, that's kind of a core thesis of 
Keynesian economics. Um, for example, if you use the US government, it's actually tracked pretty well. Um, the amount of money that gets put in different programs, for example, like every dollar put in NASA generates like 20 X returns to um, the economy in different ways based on the new tech getting created, based on um, based on new innovations and based on like the jobs it creates. Um, so that's a pretty key concept of Keynesian economics with fiscal policy. Um, and then there's also monetary policy. So monetary policy is where things get interesting and that's where a lot of tokenomics really fixate on. Um, and they also, they fixate on weird areas normally, but monetary policy is basically um, how we actually control what you call money supply um, and money demand, but mostly money supply because demand is really focused on this fiscal policy, like where you're moving money, where people are spending money, where people are investing money. Um, and then monetary policy is another way that um, like economists control um, actual prices, actual inflation and all that too. So they have a couple of different tools to do that. Um, but how it typically works is central banks normally either change interest rates, they buy bonds or they um, change like the minimum amount that other banks have to hold in their reserves. But essentially what they're trying to do is they're trying to play with this concept of money supply. So money supply is the total amount of circulating money that is going into an economy. Um, and it's actually something that the government or central banks play around with a lot um, in order to influence economic behavior in certain ways. And some people don't like this. Some people do. But the reality is that um, this control money supply actually is normally quite, quite healthy for an economy and has stopped many worse situations um, before. So it kind of goes back to this idea of the uh, quantity theory of money. So the quantity theory of money, um, that basically refers to the fact that money is intertwined between money velocity, price levels, output, and money supply. So there's several different variables here that you need to think about when you think about the quantity theory of money. Essentially, um, nominal price levels, supply of money, money velocity, and aggregate demand or aggregate output. Essentially, how people are spending your token, how people are spending all of that. So money markets, how they work, essentially they have supply and demand curves, just like um, – Econ 101, if you've seen it before, um, where on the y-axis, there's price. And on the axis, there is quantity. So we have, in an economy, um, we have a demand curve, which is basically controlled by how people are actually using the currency in an economy. Like, why do people want this currency? And then the supply curve is controlled by these uh, other aspects that we've been talking about before, monetary policy and fiscal policy. So essentially, how we are introducing new currency into the system. So people typically manage this through, or um, governments typically manage this through buying bonds, buying um, or changing interest rates, all of that. Um, but then blockchain gaming, like it works a bit differently. So now bringing this back to blockchain gaming and bringing this back into tokenomics, um, let's talk about the core consideration to think about when we're actually designing a token economy, um, given all of this information and given like all of these tools that typical economists have. So in blockchain gaming, um, there's a couple of considerations that you need to make. One, the barrier to entry typically needs to be quite low in order to have new players play the game. Um, entry price points typically need to stay relatively consistent um, in order for people to actually enter a new game. One thing that we saw with blockchain games um, in the fall or like in the winter was that the barrier to entry got extremely high for most blockchain games, where the starting point of entry at one point was like $20 to play Axie Infinity. That's pretty normal for a game around that price point. Then as the token increased, as the uh, assets increased, the uh, starting point became something like $600, that speak, or I think like $1,000 to make an Axie Infinity team. Um, it was quite, quite high. So that's actually a pretty big issue when it comes to um, building out demand for a token. Um, what you really want on the demand side is you want token price and you want token value to come from people playing the game. It sounds really simple, but it's actually quite a hard thing to design for properly. Um, so when we're thinking about like a gaming money market, like why do people want our token? Why do people want to be playing our game? Um, we need to think about demand from a different perspective than just does this token increase my expected future earnings? Um, when we're designing our token and thinking about incentives, we are thinking about so good quality demand. So good demand in our ecosystem and what we're trying to look for and encourage is one, does this token save me time in the game? Like, are people actually getting value from this currency for in-game reasons? Um, does, um, does this token progress me in a game? Does it give me social status in game? Does this make the game more fun? Um, so those are things that can kind of adjust that demand curve in the money market. 
Um, and then what we have control over, um, typically besides just gameplay, creating demand for this currency is also supply. And when people talk about tokenomics, a lot of the times what they're talking about is the supply curve and how it's adjusted. Um, a lot of people in the tokenomics field, they want to see um, a deflationary curve because if you have two curves, a demand curve that is sitting straight up and a, or sorry, a supply curve that's sitting straight up and the demand curve that's just, uh, sitting pointing down to the right, like a negative slope. If you move the currency supply to the left, um, essentially it will raise the, of the token. Um, however, you have to think about all the uh, effects that it actually might have on the economy, on demand, and how it's actually affecting gameplay and long-term viability. Um, and that's typically not healthy for the long-term of an ecosystem. So you can still have an increased token potentially if the demand curve is shifting to the right, as in more people are playing the game or the game is just getting better. People see more compelling reasons because this game saves them time or they want to progress in the game. And that's kind of the core of the tokenomics, essentially, focusing on demand manipulation rather than supply manipulation. Um, and we developed a two token system that lets us kind of uh, think about how we change supply, because supply side is still half the equation. We want to be predictable and what we want more control of rather than supply is focusing on making a good game and really focusing on getting that core concept of demand and value out of the token first and first and foremost. So we are developing a two token system. Um, the first token will be called Barry. Um, and essentially this token is quite inflationary. Um, it allows us to make sure that the game is still approachable and editable by new players and that we can still focus on creating a good and engaging game loop. Um, the idea is we want to make sure we progress through and that people feel like their time in the game is being properly reflected and rewarded. However, the second token, we can um, be a lot more predictable on the supply side. Um, we can still have a great way to build out demand for it without being so inflationary. Um, so if we go into the tokenomics of both of them, um, I think it's maybe easiest to start with the Barry token and explain how we're thinking about supply with that token and how we're thinking about demand with that token. Um, and then go into the pixel one second, because while the tokenomics of the second token are actually simpler um, in terms of explanation, the reasons of why and actually how it works a bit more complicated. So the first token Barry that we're releasing is going to be the primary in-game currency of pixels. Um, it's going to be what we call a soft currency. Um, so a lot of blockchain games, they actually haven't been, oh, not a lot because this game uh, space is still quite new, but some blockchain games, what they actually have been doing is not even blockchain backing their soft currency. They have it uh, remaining as just like an in-database um, currency that still progresses you through the game, um, still is a in-game currency, more akin to like Web2 games. We decided to blockchain back that more as a why not. Um, we have a thesis and like a kind of core belief that you know, you should blockchain back as much as you can um, in games because that's kind of why we're all here for that. So Barry will be produced um, basically by progressing through Pixel's main game loops. So as you know, Pixel's right now, that means basically farming crops and then selling them to our store. Um, so the supply of Barry is uncapped, which means that these tokens will be able to be generated basically on demand and on the fly, um, but we'll still be able to adjust the supply. Uncapped does not mean unpredictable. It doesn't mean wildly uncontrollable, uh, but we are making certain design choices with this Barry token um, in order that new players can still play the game and it's still approachable. So, so the uh, supply is uncapped, but we can actually adjust it through things like controlling the generation of resources. Um, so adjusting the replenishment time of farming, um, if we wanted to make sure that less of this token was coming into the game economy, we could do things like make crop times take longer to farm, or we can make it so that fertilizer costs a lot more, or you can make it so that tools degrade, um, and you have to actually like spend more money building out tools. Um, we can make it more difficult to harvest a certain crop, crop or if we're actually determining that um, there's not enough currency coming into the game, which also can be an issue. If there's not enough currency in the economy, um, it actually has macroeconomic effects too, um, in terms of money velocity in terms of how often money is going to be moved around and traded. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different ways that we can change it. But the key thing is we want new players to still be able to generate this currency. And that's going to lead to a relatively inflationary currency. And that's okay um, because we have a second token that we're releasing too. And that's a premium in-game currency. And with this currency, um, it's not the supply of it's not being adjusted based on the number of users playing, the amount of gameplay being uh, played. Supply is technically still uncapped 
but we're being much more clever about how we can uh, control the supply and it's extremely predictable. So it makes the uh, modeling and the economics on it much easier for us. So with the pixel token, what we're doing is technically it's an uncapped supply, but um, the uh, changing delta of the supply is capped and it's cons uh, consistent and constant. So we chose an arbitrary number right now. We're still doing a lot of the modeling to determine what that exact number actually needs to look like. It really all depends on the airdrop, but essentially we chose an arbitrary number of 100,000 new tokens coming into the economy each day for this pixel token. Um, so 100,000 new pixels will be minted each day. And what we're going to be doing is distributing it to active players that are engaging in desired behavior patterns that will benefit the Pixels ecosystem. So we kind of get to exercise fiscal policy when we're um, distributing this token. The idea is we want to make sure that the token is getting into the hands of people who will use it most effectively to increase the demand of this token. So essentially in the game, it's really quite simple. You want to give the token to the people who will be using it in-game the most, um, who will be using it because they like the game the most. And if you do that, that's the best and most healthy version of a game economy that you can create. Um, what you typically don't want to do is distribute the token to people who actually don't have any intention of using it in a way that you would want or a way that's healthy for your ecosystem. Um, if you, it's the same thing with NFTs, right? If you give an NFT to a flipper, um, they're not really doing your ecosystem any value. If you create a whitelist in the NFT space of all flippers, then your NFT floor price would be zero. Because none of the people in that NFT community are really there for the community. They're not really there for what you're building. They're there for short-term profits. In the same way, that's not great for a game economy. Um, it's really, really important to distribute a token to people who are actually using it in-game. So the way that we're distributing it is very predictable supply coming in each day. And um, we're going to distribute it to the players of the game who are partaking in great in-game uh, behaviors. So that means things like uh, whoever has land that's getting visited most, um, we're going to be distributing the tokens to them. That means things people who complete certain daily tasks or people who log in multiple days in a row or people who are like some of our best users. Um, the idea is exercise some fiscal policy that creates the most healthy economy we can through that way um, and have that approval actually be on chain. So the idea is we want the uh, distribution to be decided off chain, um, but have the approval on, on chain. This become more DAO like in the future where uh, we actually won't have full control over how this um, distribution is determined each day. Um, and actually a group of people can determine that. That can be stakeholders in this community, that can be gridcraft people, that can be pixels people, that can be all the people in the ecosystem who are have stake in a game as we move to uh, more and more DAO-like features. Uh, but the idea is we wanna make sure that it's being distributed in healthy ways. So then let's address the uncapped supply. Uh, yeah. So uncapped supply is not necessarily a bad thing. I think some people see it in games like Axie Infinity and they get really worried because they see the issues with hyperinflation that happened in Axie Infinity and um, the strength of their currency. Um, but that's because they're, they have different issues. Their issues are going to be more like our Barry issues where um, they want to generate new tokens for um, SLP based on the number of players that are playing the game. Um, and that can be exponential. If you have a million new players playing a game, that's a ton more currency coming into the economy than when you had 1,000 players. You need to adjust around that. Um, we'll probably face similar things that we need to consider in the Barry token. And that's also why we're way more focused on the Pixel token as a airdrop, as a reward to people, as all of that. Because we can actually control um, the incoming supply of the Pixel token, and it's not related to anything else like that. It's extremely predictable. So we actually have a couple of tools that actually allow us to uh, adjust the supply of the uh, Pixel token as well. And um, the main mechanism through that will be the store. So how the Pixel token works is we'll have some in-game store where um, the Pixel token is accepted. That will buy you certain cosmetic items and certain upgrades in the game that are not game loop breaking, uh, taking more of a model of Clash of Clans, for from other games. So the two currency system is actually really, really common in games. We're not inventing this. We're not the ones who are like, had this great epiphany of this. This is actually extremely common in Web2 games because they've already been figuring out how can we create game economies where we can still make money off of the game, but we don't break the game experience. Um, so taking models from those games is kind of what we're thinking about there, um, where the Pixel token will be a premium currency. You'll be able to buy it in a store, and then we can actually adjust in-store prices to determine how much currency we're taking out of the economy 
um, and how much currency is actually getting. So it's interesting because even though we're saying we're going to be adding 100,000 coins into the store each day, if we had enough demand for the store in game and um, we were able to adjust prices in a certain way, we could actually still be deflationary if we wanted to by adjusting store prices to be higher and higher. Um, obviously, there's a lot of things with that. I'm not going to get into the details of quite how that works, but I will say it's all modeled out. It's thought out by the team. Um, but think about that store as a way that we can actually enact monetary policy into the game and we can actually adjust the supply. Um, there's also really other, there's other interesting burn mechanisms we can do. Um, potentially the DAO can decide one day, hey, we don't want to uh, add any new currency into the game at all. Um, a DAO could actually say, out of that 100,000 um, new tokens that are being created each day, we're actually not going to distribute any of them and those are all getting directly burned. Um, so there's other tools like that that we can play um, with too. So um, yeah, that's, that's basically the idea behind the, uh, constant supply incoming. It, it allows us to be like, it allows us to model how this currency is going to get used and spent very easily and adjust, um, as we need to, to, uh, enact monetary supply or monetary policy on the currency allow, along with, uh, fiscal policy as well. Um, so essentially it gives us tighter control over how we can, uh, manage the game economy best and allows us to potentially, avoid problems like other projects have seen with their tokenomics. Um, Axie Infinity was a great case study for us to them and um, develop tokenomics that can help us avoid that position. And with that, all of this is in the white paper too. I think there's more details than what I just went over, but I think this is a good place to stop, um, see if there's any questions, see if there's any comments um, and maybe take in some input too. If there's anything else that maybe I didn't explain quite well. Great. Okay. Um, freak three are off. We're, we'll bring you up with us and I will head over to the discord as well, just to see if there's any new questions in there. Are you there? Okay. Uh, well, while we wait on them, let me read our first question from the discord. <laughs> what are your thoughts on balancing gameplay with berries generation? For example, if you have to wait days for a crop to grow to limit supply creation, that would hurt gameplay. How does the team think about this balance as game loops are created? Yeah, 100%. So there will be other industries in the game too. Um, so the buried one is much more focused on game design and game balance. Um, and that's kind of the difference between tokenomics and game balance, these questions. And luckily we have people on the team with experience actually balancing games. Uh, and we have support around that too. That can be quite tricky. And that's nothing, the great news about the buried token is that's actually not a new problem at all. Um, plenty of games have solved these issues around that. And we're just going to rely on the experience of the team in this case. Luckily, that's not my job um, to focus completely on balancing Barry. Okay, next question here. How does the number of players affect the tokenomics? Yeah, so the number of players on the pixel token actually might make that token deflationary. Uh, with this tokenomics setup, that's the one issue that I'm like, ah, I think we're going to be okay. It's really airdrop dependent. Um, and what we actually might do is we might give ourselves some leeway and start burning the token earlier um, rather than later. So rather than distributing all the token of the 100,000 new daily supply each day, um, we'll probably start with burning half of it and introducing more. But on the potential issue with the pixel token is that it actually might become deflationary if we're not introducing enough new supply into the uh, economy once... Um, the demand outpaces it. So um, with the buried token though, um, the idea is yes, um, the more people that come in, um, like it probably, the supply will increase. So supply can be offset with demand as well too. So if we have a game that people are actually playing and that people are actually using, um, the idea is you kind of want to track burn per user and how um, each player is spending that token per user. So one of the worst things that you can do is have a player that, um, actually isn't using the currency at all in the game. They're just trying to exit that position from there um, or they're trying to earn it, then just leave. Um, that's going to lead to a crash in the token price. But um, you have to think about the token economy uh, a bit differently than just the uh, like internal economy. Um, it's also demand externally currency and supply externally for the currency too. So the ideal situation is we're making a game where people are playing the game more for the game and they actually want to keep their money inside the economy. Um, so that's why people... When people are up watching gaming and they're saying it needs to be fun, that's the core thing. The more of that token that you keep in the economy, you keep it getting spent, then it's less of an issue, actually. 
Okay, uh, next question here. And of course, if any of you guys want to come up on stage, please request to speak. And make sure you're tagging the community team on Discord with any questions you have. All right. What play metrics are most important to you right now? DAO, time, et cetera, new players? Oh, yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of talk on how you can actually measure um, the fun of a game, like in a quantitative way. Um, our take and what some of the economists that really agree with stakes are, are um, around playtime per user and daily active users. To us, that's the biggest thing. And sessions per day per user. Um, one really statistic I just saw is our average sessions per user right now per day is over two. That means most users are coming back twice a day, which is actually a pretty crazy stat um, in the gaming space. Really, really good. Someone actually just asked about daily active users. Yeah, oh, I, I at- oh, I no, I read the acronym wrong. I said DAO, but it was D-A-U, not O. Oh, uh, my bad. Okay. Yeah, so the way you can objectively measure fun in games, typically, yeah, daily active users and playtime per user. That's the best proxy that you can have. Obviously, there's quantitative or uh, qualitative metric too. Um, like, do play testers think it's fun and all of that? But uh, if you want to get to the cold hard facts, that's a good metric. Okay, and last question I have here. So if you have any other lingering ones, make sure you get them in quickly. Why trust an economy with a DAO? What happens if we mess up the economy? How do you go back (laughs) to balance? See, that's the point of a central bank too. It's really funny in this space um, sometimes where there's this distrust of banks and I get it, but also there is a valid point to that too where um, like central banks don't always get everything right. Like you're seeing the uh, problems in the US economy right now. And the central bank policy isn't the best. Um, And like some people, there's so many disagreements on it, essentially. Um, However, if you were to put up central bank policy to a democratic vote, um, the uh, democratic vote would probably be even worse. Well, it would be much worse for the economy. Um, People would vote for like nonstop stimuluses, um, getting more money in their pockets, which is totally understandable. But also, um, that's not super great for an economy if you're just printing money nonstop right? Um, you need to have some kind of balance. You need to be smart about it too. So why I like the DAO idea though um, is more so around as we onboard more and more communities into the ecosystem, we want all these communities to feel like uh, they're being properly represented in terms of how the uh, tokens being distributed. Right now, we just have Pixels XYZ users uh, who are going to get airdrop this token. Um, in order to get airdrop the Pixel token, um, we're only airdropping it to people who are playing our game right now. Um, but we're going to have other communities come onto the game as well, too. So how do we make sure that these communities um, also get to properly benefit from it? I do like the idea of having some kind of DAO based on a governance token that is maybe distributed based on how people have been playing the game right now um, in the long term and um, having the stake and the uh, distribution decided that way. Otherwise, we just have to kind of figure out what's fair and best for you guys ourselves. And that's not really super fair to the entire community. So figuring out a way to make sure that's fair and representative while also still economically balanced. It's kind of a tricky problem, but that's what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about that. Okay, we have a really good question next. Are there concerns about age limitations as it pertains to owning a security in the US Berries becomes a tradable security? This isn't a security. Um, we passed compliance around that. We have... We're pretty, pretty certain this is not a security. Um, and we're very, very careful about how we talk about things. If you notice that we normally talk about price or anything like that, um, because price doesn't matter. Price isn't, literally doesn't matter. Um, we've been very diligent about this. We're not a security. <laughs> okay, I really like this idea someone has. Has the team thought about a little small sandbox where you can try all the collections that have been integrated before you buy? That would be so fun. Yeah, I do like that. That's that is a great idea. We have that internally for um, dev testing. Yeah. Okay, I like it. Okay, and then someone said airdrop for like owner. Yeah. So we're putting together a dashboard now. Um, one thing that we need to get right is this initial seeding of the airdrop. Um, so the two numbers that we need to get right are how many tokens this airdrop should be, and then how many tokens this um, daily reward. Um, or this daily like increase in supply should be and the daily increase in supply really does matter on how many airdrop tokens we're sending out um, because we don't want to send out too many 
on the airdrop, but we also don't want to send out too few. So there's a lot of modeling going into how we actually come to that number. Um, and basically how it is going to get determined is we need to analyze all of your play times and how you're actually spending coins in game. And we're getting all that data. Um, pretty crazy numbers, actually. There's something like 16 or 17 million coins getting spent um, in the store each day. Um, wow. Yeah, t- yeah, tons of volume <laughs> in the store already. So those are the numbers that we need to use in order to actually get an accurate estimate of the exact number of tokens we need to airdrop. What we're working on right now, the dev team's been so busy, I'm not trying to distract them too much, but we need this within the next week or so is this airdrop board. Um, we know most of the metrics that we want to reward you guys for. We'll probably spend more and more as we get closer and closer to this airdrop date. Um, but we want to make it kind of gamified to show you guys, hey, you are in this airdrop. You're getting it for this reason. You're getting it for this reason. We might make some of them secret. We might just make like a blurred out box saying airdrop bonus number one, check mark, um, stuff like that. So we're using premit.xyz um, and our own dashboard as well too. So how it's going to work is you're going to have to, uh, but then you're going to have to like uh, use our own dashboard because we have other metrics that we want to uh, reward you guys for, mostly based around playtime that aren't premit related. But uh, the premit will check for things like if you're OG, if you retweeted a tweet or two, things like that. Um, so that's getting considered. Okay. Are you able to share how the team slash VC teams will be able to benefit from the ecosystem, i.e. will part of the airdrop be going to the VC team? Yeah, um, so we're doing a public sale, right? So there's a few things we need to figure out with that. We're in an interesting position. I don't know how much I can say about this. We have, all say is we have control over this situation. Um, the VCs don't, but we want to be respectful and we want to make sure that everybody feels like the uh, investment that they put into this project is reflected well. So we're in the position where we need to figure out how we do that and how we make sure it feels like they're being treated fairly, but we have kind of the power in that situation due to the way that we were invested in. So a bit of a, bit of a situation with that, but we, we hold the cards and we want to make sure that it's fair to uh, all of our stakeholders. At the same time, we want to make sure that we are setting the ecosystem uh, in a very healthy way. No matter what, even us, there's going to be um, vesting schedules and like a long lock lockup period from the tokens. None of the team is probably going to get a day one. If they do, it'll be very, very small. Um, we're going to go on a pretty standard like one year locking schedule, maybe two with a one year clip. Um, we're trying to really build something crazy here. Um, Idle team is bought into the long term of this um, and we do it by doing things like that have a lengthy lockup period. So then talking about the public sale, will this be of the Pixel token or Barry? Yep, public sale will be of the Pixel token. Um, and that's the one that we're focusing on to get on all the exchanges and doing all the uh, due diligence around. Um, so that one will have liquidity. That one will have all of that. We've already organized most of this, just FYI, um, which is big. Most, most projects, most tokens aren't getting the kind of resources that we are getting around this launch. Um, it's pretty exciting. Okay, so that was our last question. I did just ping everyone again to see if there's any lingering last minute ones. So we can wait a minute here. But this has been really fun. I'm really excited. I've been waiting for this topic for a long time. Luke, you're probably exhausted, but but this has been incredible. Thank you. Yeah, I I'm an econ nerd. Um, <laughs> there's there's so much though uh, to go over on, um, and that was like a super super high level. I skipped so many different things, but I think the core concept of like fiscal and monetary policy is really important to know. Um, I would really encourage you guys to dig into like Keynesian economics too. Um, That's like a really, really fascinating area of economics to look into. Um, Look into international finance a bit if you're interested in this space. The more that you actually learn about econ, the more that you're going to know about tokenomics and you're going to see how bad some of the spaces tokenomics are right now. Okay, another question just came in. The goal to get berries on an exchange or just pixels? Yeah, so we only have so many resources to get a, dedicate to um, getting liquidity, getting uh, exchanges for certain tokens. All of the uh, energy will be going into the pixel token first, but um, we're not going to stop anything. If people will set up liquidity for berry or any of that as well too, um, but our efforts are focused on the pixel token. Will there be an option to rearrange the UI in the future? Um, being honest, that's probably not where we're going to spend time in the near future. Um, that will be, I mean, that would be lovely. 
Um, one thing that we're probably doing for the Gridcraft team, though, is our UI looks very farming related. We'll probably get them a different skin UI um, when you enter into the Gridcraft world. I was wondering about that. So that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Uh, will Pixel be traded internally on the game through an API? Yeah. So how our blockchain tech is going to work is we're going to do a lot of, I keep calling it bridging, but I don't think bridging is the right word really, but I actually don't know how to better describe it. So the idea is a lot of the interactions in game will be through a custodial wallet, but you're going to be able to easily transfer your assets out of the custodial wallet and into your hot wallet if you want. Um, and any interaction with the game will actually be, if you're working from a hot wallet, will kind of be by proxy. So what you'll actually do is you'll secretly send, if you have assets in your hot wallet, um, the assets to your custodial wallet. We'll do the work on a server and then we'll give it back to your um, hot wallet. Um, but the best experience will be through the custodial wallets, but we're gonna make sure that process is really, really easy to exit from. The idea is that way you don't have to sign anything. Um, you don't have to worry about security. For the assets too, it'll be a unique wallet. I, I actually, some, some stuff is crazy. I've seen some games, what they do is they made one custodial wallet for all of their users. And <laughs> we're not doing that. Um, every user will have a unique custodial wallet uh, that hosts your in-game assets to make it way, way faster to interact with the game and trade. Um, the difference between that is basically like quarter millisecond response times versus like the two seconds on Polygon, even though Polygon's fast. Um, it would still be like a two second transaction just to like farm or to trade in store. Um, we can make it basically instant if it's all your service. So then in-game trading, mailbox sending items, when can we expect that? Which chapter? Yeah, I think trading, we have it planned for, I think it's in chapter one. It's one of the stretch goals for chapter one though. So it might not make it directly right on. But then the cool thing, if it's blockchain backed, um, you'll be able to trade if you, to. you just have to move it out of our ecosystem, trade with people. Um, so you would move it from, you would move assets from your custodial wallet into your actual wallet and then trade that way. Okay, and we just have a couple people typing so we can wait a second for them. Come on, guys. <laughs> yeah, and we can go more into what that blockchain integration looks like. Um, Maybe in the next chat, it's pretty cool, the tech that we were doing for this. Um, will the interoperability with other projects affect the pixel supply? No, so that's <laughs> the idea. With the constant supply, that's a really key note. Um, this will be coded into the contract. X amount of coins will be coming into the uh, ecosystem, A, and that will be it. Um, so we're going to have that hard-coded into the contract. Um, more players, more projects, all of that will not affect the supply of the pixel token. The pixel token will be extremely predictable. Um, and you'll be able to, like, you guys will be able to run your own economics on it too, because you'll just know that this amount of the token is getting spent each day. It's getting burned each day. Like, it'll be really transparent. That's why it's on chain and that's why it's visible. Uh, did, you read, did you read that he literally asked that question just so I had to say interoperability? Yeah, guys, there you go. <laughs> I can say it now. But, anyways, good. That's why I just laughed so hard at that. Um, okay, next question. Not sure if you'll have the answer to this, but since Pixel and, and Gridcraft share tech, will they share integrated projects? Uh, do you mean uh, the integrated NFTs? Uh, so yes. So I think we announced it on the last day of May, but we're actually going to open source all the integration tech that we've done to other projects. Um, we'll have some stipulations around that, but essentially, if you guys can tell, I, the integration projects aren't amazing for our growth anymore. Um, so many other projects are doing it. So this is kind of an aggressive strategy on our end, but we want to kill other projects' growth around that. Um, we're literally seeing other projects release our own art <laughs> and say, hey, this is art that we, we did. Um, so it's a good strategy for us if we want to limit um, some competitors' growth if we open source this and take all ownership over um, NFT integrations across the space. So kind of an aggressive move on our end, but uh, also like a good doing move too. Um, we're essentially leveling the playing field making it so that everybody has access to NFT integrations and no one's special for doing it now. Did we already announce that? Or are you spilling alpha? No, we, we announced it last week. Okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we just, we need to formally announce it. Um, there's a bit of prep that we need to do for that. Uh, we need to make a website page for it. Um, and we need to open up a program for it as well too. 
Great. Okay. Well, that is all the questions we have. If you have any more, please pop them in our Discord general chat, tag the community team or myself, Heidi or Luke, and we will get back to you. But yeah, this has been really fun. I love doing more topic-based AMAs. They are always a blast. So thank you all for your questions. Thank you, Luke, for educating us all. And we will see you next week. Thanks, guys.